Gorana Draganya Gana go to Goloru Hadam Goranga Guru Tamago Pyada Kopa Vriksham Gopala Gada Vati Dam Yeti Singha Gora Govinda Vishi Kavadam Sutatam Utama Adama Kichuna Bachi Vajachi Kohula Kahe Premananda Mona Goranga Ridoya Dadi Abohula Baja Goranga Kaha Goranga Laha Gorangera Namare Jejana Goranga Baja Sehoya Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Yeshayiva Padambu Jivati Labya, Prima Bidana Parama Kumata, Tizmai Jagan Mandala Mandalaya, Chaitanya Chandraya Namaste Chaitanya Chandraya Namaste Chaitanya Chandraya Namaste Madhavirapi Gopala Sri Kriya Kripaya Jadi Tadaiva Sambhaya Pidva Vishayusta Kriya Janaha Sri Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Sasanatana Rupaka Gopala Rabunatha Dhamdrajava Panchakopatari Vishcha Kripa Sindhu Vyavacha Patitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Sadi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Spasiba So uh, what's happening today generally on Tuesday we have our uh, class we've been doing for a number of years a continuation series we call it Meeting in Purukshetra. Meeting But I've been finding it a little hard to do our online classes steadily while we're traveling. And today, there's a group of devotees here in Budapest who ask us if we would uh, discuss something more about our class we gave on Saturday. In which we spoke about tolerance and the danger of Vaishnava So, and, and they wanted to ask some questions. Hmm? Da? Okay. So I want to give time for that, but I'd also like to go a little further in another direction. And uh, discuss about how one of the definitions of a Vaishnava is someone who doesn't criticize anyone. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, we were reading the other day from Adi Lila chapter 17. And towards the end of that chapter, there's a verse. 
And this is the, the this Krishna Das Kairos Goswami presents this as the thoughts of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's text number 260. He says, Ajata, Ajapaka are Tanya Shishana. Uh, Adhyapaka means the professors or the teachers. Jata means all. All these professors, these teachers, and these Sishadana, their followers, their disciples, their followers or disciples. <laughs> as well as the dharmis, karmis, and taponishtas, meaning that the religionists, <laughs> taponishta, <laughs> the, the fruit of workers, the, the religionists, <laughs> the fruit of workers, Tapanishta means those persons who really they have great nishta and confidence in, in, in doing austerity. <laughs> Mahaprabhu says the nature of all those persons <laughs> is that they're mimdaka durja. They're all critics and they're, they're bad people, durja. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> so Prabhupada in his purport, he explains that this is a description of materialistic people who don't have any knowledge of bhakti. And he says they may be very religious and they may work very hard and do austerities and penances, but if they criticize the Lord, they're just bad persons. And he says that, that, that uh, the real offense of these persons is that they're not devotees. They are always blasphemous toward Krishna and his devotees. So in other words, someone who's not a devotee is defined as someone who's critical. In our, we have a Krishna Katami the Bindu email magazine that we make. And in the last issue, we wrote something about Red Hastaman. Red Hastaman. And we quoted a verse from the Padma Quran, which describes, defines what is a Vaishnava. It says, Vigyayascha, Vaishnava. Vigyayascha, Vaishnava. This is what a Vaishnava is. Veda, Shastra, and Urukta, Ye. They have attachment for studying Shastra. Tulsi vana palakaha, they protect Tulsi plants. Radhastami brata rata, they observe Radhastami. Sri Krishna purato ye cha, deepam yachanti shraddhaya, with faith they offer a lamp to Krishna. In Paranindam Nakuravanti, they don't criticize anyone else. That's the definition of a Vaishnava. Again, in the Chaitanya Bhagavat, Vrindavan Das Thakur, he describes this as the quality of a Vaishnava. Vrindavan Das Thakur. 
In Chaitanya Bhagavan, the Dandas Thakur says this is one of the innate qualities of the Russian. It's Anchalila chapter 3, text 29. Eise Vaishnava Dharma Shabare Pranati Se Dharma Dvajija Ite Nahi Rati that this is the dharma, dharma means the intrinsic quality, this is the dharma of the Vaishnava. Ese Vaishnava dharma sabare pranati, they give respect to everyone. Someone who doesn't like to do that, who is that person? Se dharma dvajija ite nahi rati. Someone who is a dharma dvaji, they don't have attachment for that. A dharma dvaji doesn't have attachment for giving respect to that. So what does dharma dvaji mean? Dharma dvaji, dvaji means a flag. It means someone who's waving the flag and advertising himself as a great devotee. Vajji means flag. So they're not really a devotee, they just want to act like a devotee. But the, end, the result is they're not attached to giving respect to everyone. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has told us that we should be Amani Namanadena, we should give respect to everyone. And Sridhar Swami, in his Bhavarta Deepika commentary on the Bhagavatam, Sridhar Swami, his commentary, he defines what is Ninda of criticism. He says, Nindanam Dosha Kirtanam. That Ninda means uh, whether it's true or not true, but to describe the faults of somebody else. To speak about it, that's Ninda. So in our last session, we spoke some, some about some of these principles. And we also gave the example, the example was given of um, Srivast Thakwa. And how he wasn't defending himself. Just accepted the, the criticism and showed everybody in the village, look, I'm worshiping the goddess Bhavani. No, he wasn't. And how that's the nature of a Vaishnava, they don't try to defend themselves. They give all respect to everyone else. And we spoke about how if someone uh, criticizes a Vaishnava, the Vaishnava just accepts that and tolerates it. And they forgive that person. And by doing that, by forgiving them, then some of that person's good qualities come to to the person who tolerates. And some of the faults that we may have will go to the critic. And we become free from that. So it's an important principle. So I just wanted to review that and mention those other points about what the definition of a Vaishnava is. Well, a Vaishnava is someone who doesn't criticize anyone. It's a very important principle. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also spoke about this. Before he left Navadvip, Chaitanya Mangal, 
Lord Sundas Thakur says, Lord Chandas Thakur, in Chaitanya Mandra, he describes Mahaprabhu's final instructions to everybody in the And he told the devotees that Hari Nama Bhakti Seva Kodi Vishnapa that you should establish my movement and you do that by chanting the holy name and serving the devotees. And in this way, Stapana A Dharma will establish my movement. Jena Tari Saiva Jana, this instruction I'm giving to everyone. Namatsura Antara Koi Besaiva Jana. Don't act in an envious way with anyone. Rather, Sabhe Sabhakar Mana Koro Aradhana. With all your hearts, you should worship and serve each other. That's the nature of a Vaishnava. They appreciate other Vaishnavas. And if someone finds fault with them, they tolerate that. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. And maybe some of you have some comments or questions. You can speak really loud. I'll probably what I'll do is I'll repeat what you say so the devotees who are online can also hear. Let me repeat that. Yeah. Just let me repeat what you said because the word is online and the other here. So she's just saying she found it very interesting this point, which is from the Mahabharata and also from the uh, uh, Brihanarvya Purana. That I'm just paraphrasing what she said. That uh, if someone criticizes us and we tolerate and forgive them, then some of their good qualities come to us, their, their, their good pious activities come to us, and our impious things go to them, we become purified. She says she feels bad, she doesn't want that as a motivation. And uh, I wanted to ask, is there this type of tolerance that can, my tolerance, for example, if I have to tolerate, such type of tolerance that can be beneficial even for the person who is You're asking. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm asking. Is is asking. Is that kind of tolerance beneficial for the other person? Yeah, can I do something more in, in my in consciousness or uh, my tolerance to be helpful for this person, yeah. not just to change? Well, there's a few things we can do. We can become angry with them. And that's not going to be good for that person. Because if we hurt the heart of a Vaishnava, that's very, very bad. We can tolerate that person and forgive them. But what if they just keep doing bad things? Then they're going to get some bad reaction. So there's another suggested course of behavior, which is we just stay away from that person. And we practice upeksha. 
Upeksha means we neglect them. It's not exactly the same meaning as to ignore. Like if someone's ignoring you, if a girl is in love with a boy, with a brahmachari, and he, he understands and he won't look at her like this, then the girl feels hurt. Or you've offended one of your friends and they won't look at you. That's ignoring. And that's the kind of activity. And it's painful. But Upeksha, Bhakti Vinod says, means you may give them prasadam if they're hungry. You may let them stay in your home if they have no place. What then is Upeksha mean? He says it means that you don't speak Krishna Kata with them. And maybe even we just stay away from them as much as we can if they're, if they're really crazy and violent or something. And a Vaishnav may do that not for himself, but for the benefit of the other person. Because that other person, if they, they're being so offensive, it's just going to become worse and worse. It's like one of those discussions on Facebook. <laughs> if you say something, it's just going to go on and on and on forever and ever. So you just leave it. It's not that we should think, oh, this is very good, someone's criticizing me, I'll forgive them. <laughs> and then I get all their highest benefits. And they take all my bad ones. It's very good. That's not the mentality of the Vaishnava. But the Vaishnava, they, they do that in, intuitively, naturally, just because they're tolerant and they're forgiving. And it's better than being angry with the person. It's such that we become angry with them and we'll fall down. We'll fall down. We become angry with the critic. And uh, we're not going to benefit them either. And the whole thing will just get worse and worse. Now, we should know this does not mean if you hear someone criticizing your guru or Srila Prabhupada or Krishna or something like that, criticizing some other Vaishnava, we can't tolerate that. And if we tolerate that, that's an offense. But as we were speaking the other day in our class, sometimes what can you do? You, you may want to defeat them in argument, but they don't accept defeat. So the better is just to go away. It's like a child. Sometimes a child is so angry, and you can't say anything to them. But you love them. So you just tolerate them. And we should love the Vaishnavas and just tolerate them if they're like that. But we stay away from them if there's any criticism of someone else. We just, that we can't tolerate. Okay. Anything else? Um, Krishna Kata is in the context of Krishna consciousness, what is the definition of friendship that results in advancement? 
was the definition of friendship, it results in a one-sided and ambiguous. We can have friendship, which is under one of the three modes of nature. Yeah. Passion, we can have friendship, which is uh, spiritual but passive. Which is not body, it's, it's not about the material body. Or we can have friendship in Krishna consciousness. So by your question, I presume you mean about the friendship in Krishna consciousness. Friendship and the mode of goodness is maybe you're friends with someone who has a health food store and they're also a vegetarian. And you're friends with them because you, you both like organic vegetables. That's good. <laughs> but that's not mine. Friendship on a, a spiritual level means that we're not interested in anything material. We just want to understand something about the spirit soul. And maybe we speak about the bad qualities in the material world and how it's a place of suffering. But we want friendship in Krishna consciousness. Shiva Prabhupada in a lecture in Los Angeles in 1968, he said that just as we love Krishna, we must learn to love the devotees. He said, our society is devotees. So then, how do we love the devotees? We can sit with them and talk about the war in the Ukraine. <laughs> and some devotees do that. In Ukraine and in Russia, they're doing that. But that's not real devotee association. You could go to a movie with the devotees. And because you're wearing tilak, the movie on tilak, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not friendship with the devotees. The Sattva Tantra defines how do we have friendship with the devotees. Sattva Tantra. Hari Lila Sutokchara Padeshu Sutatam Kayakari Kritis Tabahara Yata Bhakti Nanashati. Literally, it says Yata Bhakti Nanashati. We want to protect our bhakti. That is, if we don't want to fall down, then we should learn to love the bhaktis. And how do we love the bhaktis? Hari Lila Sutokchara, by hearing and chanting. Krishna Kataraka. Not by speaking about the war. Of course, when they speak about the war, family and friends there, that's human. And there's persons there we love, we're concerned about the war. It's human. It's inhuman, animal, not to speak about those things. Those topics are not going to help us with our bhakti. And some people, Hare Krishna, they, I've seen on Facebook some people who they say that Krishna sent Mr. Putin and they think like that. I've seen some devotees saying that. Krishna <laughs> I don't agree with that. <laughs> but I don't care. It's not worth it arguing with them. Because they're devotees. And what I care about, what I respect them for, is that they're chanting. And they love Krishna. And because they're hearing something from the Russian government, they have some idea 
It is not helpful to hate them. I actually, paradoxically, is actually beneficial for our movement. Because our movement should have devotees everywhere. And all different groups and all different countries. And then it's really a powerful movement. But there's some devotees we can't talk about certain things with. <laughs> and so when the war started, I was speaking sometimes in defense of some of the Ukrainian devotees, concerned about them. And some people who seem a little crazy to me, or a lot crazy, started saying some things to this other way, to pro Russian. And so I, I chose just, I just don't even want to speak about this subject. They said that you were for Russian. No, and some other people were. were so I, I, I don't want to argue about this. I want to speak about Bhakti. Because that's what Prabhupada wanted us to do. Prabhupada never hated the British. They didn't hate the Muslims when they were killing the Vaishnavas. In the writings of the six Goswamis, they were writing, at the time they were writing the books, the Muslims had invaded India. Had invaded India. They were breaking temples, torturing and murdering devotees. So the one thing they, they did a number of times, they would take the deity of Krishna and they would put him on the steps to the mosque. And so everybody who was going to the mosque they would kick the deity as they were going into the, to the mosque. And, and so many other really terrible things. How many times do you read about that in the writings of Guru Prasad? Nothing. They didn't say anything about that. Nor did Vishnu Chakravarti talk about it. Devotion. How many times do you read in the writings of Bhakti Vinodatakura and Bhakti Siddhanta criticism or complaints about the British? Oh, they were doing so many terrible things. They understood these things are relative. These problems are relative, they're just temporary. There's always going to be a Putin or a Stalin or a Hitler. There's always going to be one. And if we put all of our energy into fighting against them, then how will we do bhakti? And indirectly, you're giving uh, an instruction. You're stating that that uh, more important than bhakti is to fight against Mr. Putin. It's painful for us. We, we don't like those persons. We're not happy with someone who killed our family or friends. How can we be? But as devotees, we should protect our movement. And we should see that the, the, the real thing that can change the world is bhakti. Even if Mr. Putin is defeated in, in Ukraine. He's defeated in Ukraine. Does that mean the world is going to be a good place then? 
Does it mean that there's not going to be some other problem in the future? But we have to learn this. It's difficult, painful. We have to learn to see this. So she's saying devotees join the movement at different times and they have different understandings of how to be bhakti. How should we uh, practice our bhakti uh, together with this devotees? And how should we maintain the atmosphere of peacefulness and respect? At the same time, uh, but at the same time, while we are going through an analytic process together, how can we uh, go through this process positively? Let me repeat all that because of the reason. And I'm just going to repeat this and correct me if I say something. Okay. So, as she's saying, as we Join in Krishna consciousness, different devotees have different experiences, they have different knowledge of bhakti, and the progression in the How can we practice together and maintain an atmosphere of peace and respect and devotion? Yes, as we together go through As we're going through together in Arta and Vritti. Um, oftentimes it's good if we have uh, separate songs. <laughs> Because we, we, we just won't be able to get along with certain devotees. We will not be able to get along with them. Ah, because we don't have to get along with speaks about this in uh, his book, uh, Krishna Samhita. He says that, this is a very startling thing, he says that, uh, He says that sectarianism is a natural byproduct of the absolute truth. Sectarianism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sectarianism. The absolute truth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He said that, that when the Acharyas understand the truth, they see it with no sectarianism. But then they come to a particular place and speak to a particular kind of people. They might be Vaishnavas in their God who are trying to speak to. Or they might be meat eaters in America or China. Or people in Russia or people in Ukraine. And the message they give is going to be different in different places at different times. And he's going to give certain rules for some societies which would be different from other societies. Yeah. 
So as one community develops love and respect for the instructions they got, which they should, understand? A community naturally will, will, as it goes deeper, will have love and respect for the instructions they got from their guru, from their child. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Srila Prabhupada, when Prabhupada went to America, he called all the ladies Prabhu. There's letters he wrote to Jamuna, Prabhu, Mamati Prabhu, conversations and things. I live in India for 25 years. And no Indian language will they ever call a lady Prabhu. It's very strange. But Prabhupada did that in America. But when Prabhupada came to India, he didn't call the Indian ladies Prabhu. <laughs> so he gave a particular thing in a particular place. And as an example, some of the devotees in America, they say, we should call all the ladies Prabhu. And there's a, there's a, a class where Srila Prabhupada said that. So we should, we should address all of the men and women who are initiated as Prabhu. But I don't think Prabhupada ever spoke like that in Gujarat or West Bengal. So it's natural, one group of people, they get an instruction and they like this instruction. It's natural. But if those devotees are not very mature, then they're going to have hatred, anger, toward other instructions. They're going to say, Prabhupada didn't really mean that. He was just saying that then. And the real thing is, you should only call them Mataji. Or the other way, they'll say, Prabhupada, we should call all the ladies Prabhu. What is this Mataji? That's not <laughs> So that's sectarianism. And Bhaktivinoda speaks about three different ways. I have it on the sign of the book. It's called Alochakagata, Alochanagata, Alochagata. Three different stand types of standards. Three types of standards. Alochakagata, Alochanagata, Alochagata. The one example is a, a lochakagata, one type of standard is the way you dress. The Vaishnavi ladies in South India, they wear a kacha, it's a tail, a sari. And they don't cover their heads. Tail means like a goatee. Ah, they, they have sign like this. Ah. <laughs> Very bad, huh? <laughs> You'll become angry with them. No, you're not doing it right. <laughs> they don't cover their heads. Unless they do something bad. But in Gujarat, they don't wear the tail on the side, and they cover their heads. So it's, it's not that one is right and the other is wrong. This is called uh, alochakagata. It means different types of dress and different types of tea lot. And some wear, some brahmacharis wear saffron cloths and don't. And then there's alochan agata. Alochan agata means the, the way you do the marriage ceremony. 
Марк а он же хагата и я хагата означает то, как вы проводите свадьбу церемонию. The way you do your arctic. Some Vaishnavas they do all these things. Over each thing. Some Vaishnavas they take the incense and they offer to their Guru Dev and then they do Some Vaishnavas just chant a mantra for them. Some Vaishnavas consider that because they're initiated then everything is offered to the Guru Dev. There's a little different mantras you use practices. That's a lochanagata. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a, a locha a locha gatta. A locha gatta uh, refers to the, the type of philosophy that you're stressing. And the particular form of the Lord that you stress. We stress the form of Krishna in the Radhanath. But in South India, they stress the form of Vishnu. Or Ramachandra. And we don't hate them. Bhaktivinoda says that when we go to some other church, temple, or mosque, where they're worshiping the Lord in a different way than us. We should think they're worshiping my Lord, but in a different way. And we should pray, my dear Lord, please, may I not find fault with them. We also respect this. So how can we get along in such a situation? If we try it as a, as a worldwide movement for everyone to come together, which is what's happening, and some people say we should have lady gurus, someone said we shouldn't have lady gurus, some say we should call them lady gurus, someone said we should call them, call them Mataji, we're going to have big confusion. It's controversial. I live in Arisa for 25 years. And there's traditionally many lady gurus. Ganga Mata Goswami and some other ladies. There's one disciple, Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta. She had about 300 disciples in the list. And people accept that. At least in some parts of Arisa. But in some parts of Gujarat in South India, they won't accept that. So, how can we get along? We should look for our similarities. And we should accept that the differences in our movement actually are our strength. Our unity, our strength is in differences, not in uniformity. Our strength is that, the, that we have some people in China who think that China is the best country in the world, but they're devotees. And maybe they hate Russia, and they hate Ukraine, they hate America. <laughs> and some people, we have some devotees in Russia who hate Ukraine, and they hate America, and they hate China. <laughs> That's not a weakness in our movement. And we need to go a little higher in our bhakti and see that that's actually our strength. But then a problem comes. We had, we had two ladies from Ukraine living in our ashram in Pori with us for four months, 
Six months. Uh, six months. And one of them, she was from Mariupol. And her mother is, as far as I know, still in Mariupol. Still in Mariupol. So I can tell her you should be very broad minded. Like that. But if she gets around someone, Pro Putin and pro, it's going to be very painful for her heart. And she may even feel very angry because her, her mama is there. It's natural. So she needs to rise above that. She doesn't mean she has to deny that. Maybe she can't. It's, it's not so we, we can't just deny our, our family and friends. But we should see that on the platform of Krishna consciousness, it transcends all those things. And, and I, I love them because they're devotees. As persons, maybe I don't want to associate with them. <laughs> and, and that's okay. I mean, in our movement, there, there, there's so many passionate people. I, I have friends who are so passionate. Women should be allowed to be guru. I have other friends who say that's the worst thing in the world. If women become guru, it's going to destroy the movement. <laughs> Why can't we just tolerate? Let individual persons make their own choice. If some, if some girl, one of your friends, wants to marry a boy, a black African man from, from Nairobi, maybe your family feels a little funny about that. But that's her choice. And you don't have a right to tell her who she can marry and who she can't marry. I feel I don't have a right to tell someone who can, they can accept as guru and who they can't accept as guru. And I don't care if that per, their guru happens to have the body of a Russian, an American, or a man or a woman. But I also respect that in some places, maybe in Ukraine, they may not be very enthusiastic about Russian gurus. <laughs> in some places, they may not be very enthusiastic about women gurus. So I needed to, to see those things are not so important. Those are just external standards. But the real unity that we have is in Krishna consciousness. Now a problem comes. The problem comes when we work very hard in our community to have certain standards. The Hungarian Yatra, we have very good standards. Now, if someone comes from some other place, and maybe their guru told them, anyway, before you do puja at home, at least, you don't have to take a bath. Maybe they, maybe they live in Mongolia, they only, people only take baths once or twice a month. <laughs> So they just tell them you do option and sprinkle some, some water in your head. And, and that's what their guru told them. But then they come here. And, and then they, well, I want to go on the altar. I haven't taken bath, but I, my guru said it's okay. So you have to do two things. You have to keep the standard that you have here. But at the same time, not hate that other person. That requires maturity. It requires that we try to understand the heart of the other person. 
and they respect them. I, I, I give many examples of this. It's, it was shocking. Not all Vaishnavas are vegetarian. A powerful example. A powerful example. Garuda. Garuda. He eats fish, he eats snakes, he eats turtles, but he's a great devotee of the Lord. But you can't do that. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada gave us certain rules. But if Garuda wants to come to our temple, what are you going to tell him? You can come in, but first you have to be vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? If we don't like you, go away. <laughs> You're eating fish. <laughs> Understand? Is that, is that helpful? It's a very, very good question. Very important question. See, see, this question is such a difficult question because when we give class in ISKCON, we want to tell everyone you should be vegetarian, you should follow four regulated principles. But we can preach that. Yes. But at the same time, Garuda, <laughs> he's a non vegetarian Vaishnava. And there's maybe other examples too. So we have to see, we have to be careful and respect all Vaishnavas. But at the same time, keep our standards. And to answer your question, we can work together on the platform of the devotion to Krishna. service, the devotional service, at the same time we should have some sangha so that we should uh, have a cessation with each other. We should do service. Yes. So that we should, we should have satsanga with each other on spiritual topics, matters, uh, so that we could understand each other. Mm. So she's saying that, that we should have such sangha together on topics so we can understand each other. But, no, but, not, not on topics that we can understand each other, but to have such sangha so that so that we can result we can yeah. understand each other. Yes. So to support what you say, da, excellent. <laughs> Bhagavatam eleven three thirty. Read that down. It's a very good verse. Prasparanu katanam pavanam bhagavadgisa mito rata mitas tushya nivita mita atma. Uh, the Bhagavatam says that we should learn how to associate with devotees. And we do that, pavanam bhagavad katanam pavanam bhagavad yasa. We have this bhagavad yasa. We speak about the glories of Krishna. But it should be paraspara. Paraspara means there's back and forth discussion right now. It's not just a lecture. In English, there's a word which I don't know if you've ever translated or not. It's called it's pontificate. Pontificate. Yeah, when someone pontificates, it means they're acting like the Pope. Like and they're giving like a lecture, which is one sided kind of thing. So, Krishna Kata is not the same as pontificating. <laughs> 
rather they should be back and forth with the And that back and forth creates shamba. But it's not so simple because some devotees, they, they say the most important thing is vanasham dharma. And we should follow manasamhita. And they have strong faith in that. And that's okay. We respect them. They're Vaishnava. Other devotees, they say, I'm living in Denmark and Holland. I'm living in San Francisco. And we have many gay and lesbian Vaishnavas. And so many people can be Vaishnavas. So it's going to be, if you put those two groups together, <laughs> they're just going to get a big headache. So bash their heads against each other. They just bang their heads. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. Both of them can be great devotees. And I could establish that also. It's not that we have to do Vanashram. Vanashram. It's recommended for us. But some people are outside of it and they can still practice bhakti. Ashram is a place of ashraya, or shelter. But bhakti gives shelter itself, even if someone's not practicing Vanashram. And the proof is Srila Prabhupada's disciples. They weren't practicing Vanashram. So Prabhupada said that once to someone. He said, you didn't come here because you were doing Vanashram. Your strength is you were taking shelter of bhakti. But at the same time, sometimes our bodily identification is so strong that we need to follow some Vanashram. Because our, our, we're paying more attention to our body than we are to bhakti. So for that reason, it, it may be necessary. But my point is not that bhakti is good and vanashram is bad or vice versa. My point is that different groups will have different faith in different processes. Some places they eat rice. Rice. Some places they eat gretchka. <laughs> Both are okay. <laughs> but some people will say rice is good, gretchka is bad. <laughs> and other people say, I can't eat rice, but I like gretchka. <laughs> Maybe you have your community of Gretschka lovers. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't listen to those rice fanatics. <laughs> That's necessary. We need small communities, but a broad vision. Because we want the whole planet to become Krishna conscious. And we demand that as part of that Krishna being Krishna conscious, everybody on the planet has to eat rice. No bread. No gretchka. Everybody can only eat rice. Because that, that's what, what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wrote. How is the whole planet going to become Krishna conscious? Or we demand that everybody wears a sari or a dhoti. They're not going to become Krishna conscious. I was, I can't say what country, but there was one, one Islamic country we used to go and give classes in. And I'm giving class here every day for a week. One lady was coming to the class every day. 
And she was wearing a burqa. I never had a lady wearing a burqa in classes. <laughs> so after a few days, I, I asked him, who's that lady? <laughs> he said, oh, that's such and such Mataji. She does namaz five times a day. And she chants 16 rounds every day. But she has to wear a burqa. Or her family will kill her. She can't change that. And Prabhupada said, you can be a Muslim, you can be a Christian, you can be a Sikh, and be a member of the Hare Krishna movement. He said, they can keep their own religion and still be a member of it. If we don't have that attitude, how is Krishna consciousness going to spread all over the world? It won't be possible. There's always going to be these different types of dress, behavior, food. <laughs> it's difficult to understand, isn't it? Because we get so used to our particular standard. It's hard for me. I, I traveled, I've been all over the world giving classes in different places. The first thing that I do when I go somewhere is I want to talk to the leaders. And I find out what is their mood. At one place I, I went to, their mood is that, that wearing dhotis and saris is nonsense. You should wear Western clothes. Because in their country they say people don't appreciate that. In other places, I, I know when I go to Ukraine, they, they want the devotees to wear dhotis and saris. So I, I, I go along with that. Because those things are not so important. And I want to support the local culture. I want to support the local culture. Because we need to have some local culture. You should, when I first time I went to Kiev, the devotees wanted to cook for us. And with great love, they made rice, dal, chapatis. They thought Madhavananda and Krishna Kona are living in India. They might be like this. It was a very amazing kind of chapati. You could use it like a Sudarshan chakra. <laughs> if you threw the chapati, it would break the wall. And you couldn't eat it. Because they didn't really know how to make chapatis. <laughs> now they know how to do that. But at that time I told them, maybe you can just make some grechka. <laughs> some borscht. <laughs> some bread. <laughs> And they da da da, and, and it was very nice. <laughs> so we should learn. We should love the devotees, encourage them in their own culture. And what your babushka taught you is not necessarily bad. That's your culture, and you love her. And she has some wisdom. Maybe you have to apply it in a Krishna conscious way. But you can't live like someone in a rish, I tell you. <laughs> so we should understand that and Prabhupada understood that. Okay? <laughs> it's a very difficult subject. I get in trouble sometimes. I go places. What does he mean? You don't have to wear a dhoti and sari. Of course you have to. Da, 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 it's important. You should do. 
But then I go somewhere else and say, why is he wearing a dhoti? He shouldn't do that. <laughs> and I, yes, yes, it's okay. You don't have to wear a dhoti. <laughs> but what's important is bhakti. And that's what I want to speak about wherever we go. I want to speak about Krishna. I want to speak about Krishna bhakti. But I also want to respect the local culture. Okay, how to show? <laughs> okay, anybody else with anything? What to do? Am I going to get in trouble? <laughs> Okay. Okay. So she's asking, let me repeat the question. She's asking that we spoke something in our previous class about forgiving people and how can we forgive someone. Um, sometimes it's just artificial. You may go to some new age class. And they tell you, you should just forgive everyone. You should love everybody. But that doesn't always work. Once, after my grandmas left this world, my godbrothers, many of them started quarreling. Because again, there's different uh, types of devotees. There's Western devotees and Maria devotees, and they see things in a very different way. So, uh, one, at one program for my grandmas, it was a, I don't know, the Ask Puja program or something. One of the devotees got on the stage and he, and he told everybody there, he said, We should love each other. And he said, you, he said, I want you to get up right now and turn to the person next to you and tell them, I love you, and give them a hug. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was with one of my old goddaughter friends, and we kind of looked at each other. And we <laughs> We stood up. <laughs> but it didn't solve the problem. So that's sentimental. It's nice. It sounds very good. It, it, it's very easy to say that we should forgive someone. But what if someone offended your guru? What if someone did something which really disturbed your bhakti or your service? And it's not so easy to forgive that. So we practice tolerance. To picture. And that to take sure that that tolerance, that's the, the, the doorway to forgiveness. When we tolerate someone, it doesn't mean we agree with them. It doesn't even mean we forgive them. We just tolerate them. And the other thing is we want to uh, practice speaking in a sweet way. Jani Krita Parani, Sattva Vadi, Pritamvada. We want to practice uh, Priyamvada. Priyamvada means we speak sweet words. Uh, 
Приемвада doesn't mean you forgive the person. But we have to become mature enough that we can say something sweet to them, even if we don't forgive them. Rupa Goswami, he defines Priyamvada in mm -hmm. Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Jane Krita Paradhi, Pisantavadi Priyamvada. That even if someone's offended you, you still speak in a sweet way to them. That's not the same as forgiving. In the Vishnu Purana, there's a long description about the glories of forgiveness. That's a higher principle. And we should try to come to that. But sometimes they just can't. You can tell someone, turn to the person next to you and say, I love you and hug them, but <laughs> it's, it's just. It doesn't really mean anything. But we can practice Priyambhata. Jani Krita Paradi, Sampravadi Priyambhata. That means that we can speak in a sweet way, in a kind way, even to someone who's offended us. And this, in uh, Rupa Goswami, gives a very beautiful uh, example for Krishna. In Krishna, Kaliya had come to Braj. Kaliya killed all the cowherd boys and the cows. Kaliya. Krishna was very upset. And Krishna told him, Kaliya, get out. Sent him away from Braj. And then Krishna, Rupa Goswami says, he spoke this verse and he apologized to Kaliya. So don't feel bad. <laughs> he said, I'm a cowherd boy. And I have to take care of the cows. It's my job. It's nothing personal against you. <laughs> but you and the cows just don't work together. So you have to go somewhere else. That's Priyambada. So that exercise of Priyambada, when we do that as an exercise, that helps us. It helps us to, to forgive that person. Because then we can see that, okay, he's a snake. He's really poisonous. He killed a whole lot of the bridge bosses. But he also offered prayers to Krishna. Krishna put his feet on his head. He has some good qualities. And maybe I don't want to associate with him. But if I can see something good in him, even in Kaliya, then I can take another step toward forgiving. You see, if you don't, if you can't see anything good in someone, how can you forgive them? In other words, you just see the person is just completely evil. They're just totally bad. How can you forgive them? You can't. But you see, okay, Mr. Putin, but he likes cats. <laughs> He's nice to his daughter. He has some good quality. You can see some good qualities. And if we see those good qualities, then the wonderful thing is we get to keep those good qualities for ourselves. It's just the opposite of the fault finder. The person who's going around criticizing everybody he gets to keep the faults that he sees. But Prabhupada in Madhulila Chaitanya Charitamrita he says, this is a word for word quote. 
The qualification of a Vaishnav is he's a dosha darshan, he doesn't see fault. So if we don't see fault in him, we see some good quality, even, even in Mr. Putin, in everyone, even in Kalia, even in Kansa, in Kansa. <laughs> Everybody has some good qualities. Kamsa, he, he knew a lot of Shastra and Sarabhava. And he was, he was very religious in his demoniac kind of way. <laughs> About Vanashram Dharma and like that, he protected his citizens. He cared for them. So we can appreciate that. And he's better than me. Kongsa is better than me at that. Then I, I can forgive them. Is that helpful? It, it's really, it's not just something with a simple answer. But it's a way of life. It's even more than a way of life, it's a perspective that we need to take on. A way of seeing the world. And if we have that perspective, then we can come to the point of forgiveness. But probably we have to cultivate that perspective also. You can't just artificially. You can't just artificially say that Putin's a good guy. You can't just artificially just because devotees say you should say that. You can't. But if you have this perspective, you can, you can try to come to see that even Kaliya has some good qualities. And probably he's a lot worse than Putin. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Anybody else? In you say that the way to be forgive, to forgiveness is patience. So that in that we live in such age that for us it's very hard to uh, to exercise patience. That we are impatient. Why should it take strength to be patient if you are on the level of Let me repeat all that. It's, it's as as it so she's kind of summarizing, simplifying maybe some of the things that I'm saying, uh, and equating tolerance with patience. Yeah, she's saying the pathway to forgiveness is to be patient. I didn't exactly say that, I was saying tolerance. But the two are similar. Understand. And this morning in class, Naranja Maharaj was saying that uh, we're not so patient. It's, it's not just artificial, we can just say, be patient. And we're patient. So where does that strength for patience come from? We have to have an Чтобы, 
As long as we're attached to our body, then who's not attached to their body? Who doesn't think? Do I really think that it? I'm not from America? Do I not think my mama is my mother? Am I not attached to my native language? What my mother used to cook for me when I was a child. That's not, you can't just make a wave a wand and make that go away. And if you artificially try, you just become a fanatic. And you may think that it, you're being a pure bhakta. That all you're being really is just crazy. And you'll end up falling down. Because you can't do that. Of course, this depends on how deeply we're taking shelter of bhakta. So therefore, sadhu guru, who understands our nature, gives us certain instructions. And for some devotees, they say, you should get married. And for some devotees, they say, you should worship the deity. Some devotees, they say, you should distribute books, and you should not marry. Guru understands what our psycho, personal psychophysical needs are. And it's different for everyone. So that strength for patience comes when we, we, we if you don't have any salt in the subject, you go crazy. No salt. They may tell you that salt is bad for you. I can't live without salt. I have to have some salt. So that's our bodily identification. Once in one temple, we were given a class. And we were telling the men that you should do two things every day to protect your ashram. We have an ashram, we need to protect the roof and the rain will come and disturb the budget. And to protect your grihasta ashram, there's two things a man should do every day, I suggest you do. Every day you should tell your wife, I love you, and you're very beautiful. Are we showing? The ladies in the class, they all like that very much. <laughs> there was one Brahma who was translated from me. His face became bright red. <laughs> anyway, after the class, when Mataji came to Krishna, she was speaking in Russian. And she was crying. And I, I couldn't believe what's wrong. And Krishna Kun was translating. And the Mataji was saying, I got married. I just want to have a baby. My husband took me on a honeymoon. To the mountains and a nice cottage. To a nice cottage. Brought his two brahmachari friends. <laughs> and his brahmachari friends told them, don't stay in the room with her, she's Maya. <laughs> and don't eat any food cooked by her, she's Maya. <laughs> so this poor girl was crying. <laughs> I just want to have a baby. <laughs> so having a baby is not bhakti. Otherwise, every woman who has a baby, she can be a pure devotee, right? But for her, she has to have a way to have a baby and do that in bhakti. 
So that strength, that strength for that patience, we can only have it when we're situated in our right position. We try to push that poor Mataji that she should try to act like a brahmachari. It's crazy. And, it, and it's not going to give her strength. It's not going to give her patience. She's just going to go crazy. Can I read some questions online? I have a bunch of questions. Um, can you, let's see, can you stop that fan? That's okay, it's okay. So you have some family, I think. So, uh, uh, Thai Prabhu is saying, I traveled a lot by good fortune. Gwani Thai. And, and, yeah. and uh, he's gone from a big community, a small community, back to a big community. And that's helped me to know different types of devotees. But what about devotees who just live in one place for a long time and they have no experience of other cultures or other standards? How can they learn tolerance when they meet different persons? I've seen some devotees like this in India. Some de I've seen some devotees like this in some places in India. They've never been around Western devotees. They only know rice dal chapatis. They can't understand grechka. So they they have a very difficult time understanding different things. So how can they practice tolerance? How can they learn tolerance? So <laughs> I just got a comment. Somebody wrote, um, <laughs> "How can they learn tolerance?" Uh, it's a natural quality of bhakti. And when we hear shastra in bhakti mahima, the glories of bhakti. And Bhakta Mahima, the glories of the devotees. Then it's natural that we can respect them. At the same time, we may like Gretchka or rice. I hope that helps. Uh, someone else wrote, I'm not, I don't think I can understand your English. Saying sometimes someone may also be cruel. On the comment list, he said that Putin likes little boys. Lila Purushottam Bruce Kami, you see, I can hear it. Yeah, I don't mean that's not read that one either. Okay, I'm going to type a book at the comments. Krishna likes when Lalita criticizes him. Krishna likes. He likes ah, it. <laughs> but uh, he's less attracted to devotees who always glorify him. <laughs> and tolerate him like with many. So does that mean then we should all criticize Krishna <laughs> and he will make more advancement. <laughs> Krishna will like it better. <laughs> we shouldn't be like Rukmini. We can't imitate. Lalita is a very, very exalted eternal associate of the Lord. And we want to be Anugatya. We want to be following Lalita Saki. 
they do more than we do Rukmini. So we read about Lalita. And we try to understand her. We pray to her. Maybe we don't pray to Rukmini. But we don't imitate Lalita. And we respect Rukmini. That's more our position. In fact, Rukmini is a lot more advanced than we are. <laughs> Rukmini is a whole lot more advanced than we are. I'm going to type it uh, Recently, I had an experience how I was criticizing in my mind some senior devotees and it was poisoning my devotion and taking away my enthusiasm. And but as soon as I was able to change my mind with the help of some friends. Then my attraction, my respect, my appreciation for that senior person multiplied and I became very happy. <clears throat> there's, there's a famous expression that you see the cup, the cup half empty or half full. And there's some people just go around, the cup is half empty, the cup is half, it's terrible, it's half empty. It's a bit, the cup is half full, the cup is half full, it's very good. So a Vaishnava is someone who doesn't see fault in anyone. Now, there's different types of uh, different levels of that. Mm -hmm. And Vishnu Chakravarti talk who explains this in the in a commentary in Sartre Darshan in the fourth canto of the Bhagavatam. <clears throat> he says there's four types of uh, sadhus and four types of asadhus. I'm just looking to see if I can find it real quick in Okay, so there's <clears throat> so there's the Mahat. Mahat means a great person. And the Mahat sees some good in everyone. But the Mahat also sees some faults. But the Mahat is a great person because he sees, although they have some faults, still they can become benefited, they can be transformed if they practice bhakti. Sometimes a Mahat may chastise someone. And their words are a little bitter. Words are, bit, are bitter. It's like neem juice. Neem juice is very bitter, but it's good for your health. Sometimes. But the Mahat doesn't reject or condemn anyone. The only thinking how that person can be benefited. Then there's a Mahat Tara, Mahat Uttara. He's a, a greater person. Ah, it was the next time. Uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And he, that person also sees good and bad in others. But they just focus on the good. They just speak about the good things. And Vishwanath says that, that such a person, if he sees a materialistic money-making person, he's a sense gratifier. But 
He takes good care of his guests. I'm going to have to try to be real quick because we have to go soon. But I want to try to go through these four types of good people and bad people. And then there's a Mahatam, the Mahat Uttam. That person, he sees whatever good qualities everybody has and he magnifies them. And he doesn't see even the smallest fault in anything. And Vishwanath explains, he says, this person, he thinks someone comes and steals his blanket and it's a cold winter in, in Moscow. And the sadhu thinks, actually, he was a great saintly person. He stole my blanket, but he had a knife. He could have hurt me. He didn't. Actually, he's very merciful. He's a good person. That's a Mahatuta. And then there's the Ati Mahatuta. An extremely great person. And he sees good things in everybody, even when there's no good qualities. <laughs> and they think that, that in this world there's no bad people, everyone is good. That's the Uttama Adhikar. And we can't imitate that artificially. You'll fall down. Mm -hmm. We have to, we have our certain bodily nature. And there's some people just by our bodily nature, we just think this is our enemy. This person is good, this person is bad. So maybe we can't uh, artificially come to this platform, but at least we should try to understand it theoretically. So Vishnu says there's also four types of bad persons. Asadhu. Asadhu, he sees some, he sees bad things in everybody. He also sees some good things. But he, he, he just takes it for granted that whatever good things they have, they're going to go away. <laughs> and he takes it for granted that everybody has some bad intention. Worse than the asadu is the asadutra. Mm -hmm. uh, he only sees bad things in everybody. He overlooks any good things. He sees a sannyasi. He's, if he sees a sannyasi, he thinks he's just trying to fill his belly. And actually, he's a lusty person, he's fallen. He's an asadutra. But even worse than him, asaduttama. Especially wicked person. He takes small faults and he magnifies them. He doesn't see anything good in anyone at all. If he sees a sannyasi, so he's a bogus person. He should be staying in the forest while he's living in the house of a rich man. His only motivation is he wants to take the money of that rich man. That's the asaduta. And then there's the acha saduta. He's the extremely wicked person, the worst. And he sees bad in everyone, even when there's no faults. And he thinks that there's no good persons in you. Everybody's bad. Everybody's evil. Yet, he's the worst person. So we want to cultivate the Mahat qualities. Maybe we're not able to overlook someone's faults. 
But then we should cultivate trying to see some good things in everyone. Ravan. Ravan was very expert in chanting mantras. Very, very expert. He was a very powerful fighter. We can see some good quality. He's not all bad. There's no one who's all bad. Okay. Um. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to stop there. We have to go see more in Japan. Is that okay, Harisha? Yes. Yeah. Everybody's so satisfied. Okay. So also I'm speaking to devotees who are online. Remember the Gopal Prabhu and Madhusudan Roy. Hi, Krishna Madhusudan Roy from Jagannath Puri. And Elena, nice to see everybody here. Uh, if anybody has any further comments or questions or anything, I'm going to go offline, but you can write them either on our Facebook page or you can write them to us on WhatsApp. But if everybody's here, you can tell someone else. Thank you all very much. Shiva Prabhupada ki, Samadhi Ravata Vindaki, Gopre Manandi, Panch